I am so excited to be here. Um, I look forward to all that God is going to do in our midst in these next brief moments that I get to share with you. Uh, and I don't take this opportunity lightly. My beautiful wife, Rachel, uh, couldn't join me today. She is home with our kids, Caleb and Nathaniel, who was born just four weeks ago. Uh, yes. Amen. I thank God for all his blessings. I also bring greetings from uh, Harvest Time Church, Stanford. Um, God is doing wonderful things in the life of the church, in our city, in our community. And we are truly grateful for uh, all of you for your prayers, uh, love, and support. Well, I am thrilled to open God's word with you this morning. So if you have your Bibles, how many brought your Bibles? Amen. Good. About half of you. <laughs> Open your Bibles to Colossians 1. We're going to read from verses 1 through 8. Colossians 1, verses 1 through 8. Colossians 1, 1 through 8. We have the verses up on the screen as well. It reads like this. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ, on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. I believe God is going to do some wonderful things in our midst. Are you excited? Yes. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We are so grateful that you are the true source of light and wisdom. Holy Spirit, I invite you to come and teach us the truths. Empower your people to live in the light of the gospel, declaring its truths and embodying this truth through our actions. Have your way in us. In your beautiful name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, every book in the Bible has a theme. Although it's difficult to uh, condense uh, every book with just one theme. There's, sometimes there's more than one theme. But there's this always this underlying theme, one primary idea. For example, Genesis speaks to us about the beginnings of the human race. Exodus is about deliverance. Ruth is about redemption. Psalms is about praise. And you come to the New Testament and you have all these wonderful books. Matthew is about the kingdom of God. Acts is about uh, the establishment of the early church uh, and the spread of the gospel. Ephesians is about knowing your true identity in Christ so those are just some examples. And you come to Colossians, the big idea here is the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ. In other words, Paul is presenting Christ as the center of the universe. And he's saying, Jesus is enough. That's what he's communicating. Jesus is enough and there's nothing more you need than to be in Christ. That's his message. His message is very clear. That Christ is enough. He is all sufficient. Folks, that's a message that we all need to hear, especially when living in a time as this one. There's danger all around. We're living, we live in the midst of so much uncertainty. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Just think about all the things that have happened just in the last couple of months. So think about it for a minute. All the things that have transpired all over the world in the last couple of months. What happened in Orlando. What happened in Dallas. What happened in Turkey. In Germany. In Japan. 
what happened in Nice, France, where a guy drove a 19-ton truck and, uh, and, and he ran it through the crowds, killed over 80 people and injured over hundreds. Who saw that coming? All those people were just going about their business. Maybe there were some were coming back from work. Perhaps some went out to get some groceries. Some were probably out for a nice evening walk. Who saw that coming? And you wonder, when will the, these senseless killings stop? And you wonder what it would take for all of us to come together and to live in peace. Is that even possible? The truth, the truth of the matter is that the world has become such an unpredictable place to live, to raise your kids. There's always something tragic happening. It's like someone said, you live in between the seesaw between hope and fear, security and anxiety. It's so true. One day you have hope and the next day it's gone. One day you think you're secure and the next day you're anxious, you're fearful because the future looks so scary. And as Christians and as the church, the bride of Christ, what should be our response? How should we live in the midst of all this chaos? You say we need to pray. Yes, we need to pray for sure. We need to pray for America. We need to pray for all the nations. But what should be our response? How are we supposed to live our life? In the midst of all that is happening. And is, is God even watching all this? Is God even saying anything about this? Is the problem with God that he's not speaking? Or is the problem with man that he's not listening? You know the latter is true. The Bible says, for God speaks in one way, sometimes another. But man does not perceive it. He doesn't understand it. It is my prayer that the Holy Spirit will elevate our view of Christ in these days. I know there's, there's sin that has clouded our perspective. It has diluted man's view of God. But we need to pray for ourselves and for the world for them to accept God's grace and love into their life. And, and, to, grow, and to grow in an understanding of Him. It is my prayer that we will grow in the understanding of the power of the gospel and the purpose of the church here on earth. That Christ will be expanded and impressed upon us so much so that we will seek him wholeheartedly and in him we will find all our answers. Because as Paul says, he is what? All sufficient. He is enough. You know, there's nothing more moving than to see a Christian in the midst of great suffering, sacrifice, and pain, to be able to say with all their heart and soul that Christ is enough. For someone to say, no matter what goes on around me, I will not be moved because he, had, he has commanded me, be strong and be of good courage. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is going to go wherever you go. Friends, when you put your faith in Christ, when you put your hope in Christ, when you trust Him with all your life, you will know what you have in Him. In Him and Him alone, we will find what we need and what this world needs. And don't you ever, ever doubt that he's not enough. Don't you ever doubt that he is not sufficient. The Bible says, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made what? Perfect in your weakness. So Paul is in a Roman prison writing this marvelous, this wonderful letter to the church in Colossae. With this one underlying theme about the sufficiency of Christ. That Christ is enough. And the church at Colossae included both, included both Jews and the Greek, the Gentiles. So the problems they faced were both legalism from the Jews and mysticism from the Gentiles. The Gentiles were all about keeping up with the law. 
they preached that salvation comes strictly from obeying the law. That it was a work-based system. So they took pride in their cultural and religious heritage. And they considered Gentiles to be unclean. So they were probably nagging their, their friends, Gentile friends, knowingly and unknowingly about keeping up with the law. So there was this tension. Tension between both parties. And there were some people who had gone away from the truth. And they were preaching the false doctrines. So Paul writes this letter to bring this church back, to refocus them, to bring this church back on track and away from the heresy that was spreading there. And in doing so, he also addresses something that was taking place as a result of the influence of the Roman Empire. You see, there was, we, have, we have never seen anything like the Roman Empire. It covered over 4,000 miles and it ruled the world for over 1,500 years. Let me put that in perspective for you. America is about 240 years old. America has had a great impact on the world in just 240 years. Now imagine the impact of the Roman Empire, which ruled the world for over 1,500 years. But why are we talking about Rome? Here's why. Because Paul is going to address a concern. He's going to address a concern with Rome. He's basically going to say, Rome is not your hope. Your hope is not in this massive, humongous empire. It's not what Rome can do for you. It's not what Rome can bring. Man, this is a truth that we need to hear today. Friends, our beloved country is not going to save us. No country for that matter will save us. So we need to take away our hope from what the nations can do for us and what our leaders can do for us. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying to remain hopeless in those areas. But what I am saying is that as Christians, we need to get our priorities straight. As Christians, we need to put our hope in Jesus because He is the hope of the world. The Bible says, in Him, the nations will put their hope. We live in a dark world that desperately needs light. Some 2,000 years ago, Christ came as that light into this broken world. And sometimes we knowingly and unknowingly we forget that he still remains that light. Friends, he was the light. He is the light. He is always, he will be always our light. And don't ever question that. In spite of what's happening around us, may the Lord open our eyes. Expand our understanding to know him more so we can know the plans that he has for our lives, for our church, for our communities, and for this world. So Paul here gives us three elements of Christian spirituality that he sees in the life of this church in Colossae. And he's so thankful. He's like a proud dad. He's so thankful for them. He's so joyful that he celebrates all that God is doing in them. You see, despite the heresy that was spreading, the false teaching that was, that was threatening the Colossian church, despite the fact that some teachers were presenting this, this low view of Christ, he was proud. I mean, this was a great church, generally speaking, a fabulous, thriving church. So he presents all these wonderful qualities that he's so proud of. And what we need to understand is that these qualities are the hallmarks of the work of God. In the soul of a man. It is the result of knowing God at the deepest level. And coming to an understanding of the total sufficiency of Christ. So he starts off by giving thanks. What is he thankful for? It's not a quiz. It's up on the screen. What is he thankful for? Their faith in Christ. Be known for your faith in Christ. Be known for your faith in Christ. Colossians were known for their faith in Christ, and he's so proud of them. What a wonderful reputation to have, isn't it? To be known for your faith. Some are being known 
for being dead on the vine. Some are known for being lukewarm. But here's a church that is strong in its faith. What a wonderful reputation. It is my prayer that our reputation will be built on our faith in Christ and nothing else. Friends, when we come together as the people of God, we help build the reputation of this house. And that is so important to understand. You see, faith is that essential item in life. Faith in Jesus is what matters. Having knowledge is good. Good works are necessary and without them, there is no valid reason for believing that someone is saved. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, self-control. Those are things that we want to see. All those things are wonderful, but our faith is essential. It is central because the Bible says without faith it is impossible. Do you understand that? It is impossible to please God. It doesn't get any clearer than that. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You see, our faith is what invites us, invites God and maintains His presence in our lives. It is that substance that cuts through the physical realm and connects us with God in a powerful way. It is that basic element that helps us acknowledge God's presence in our lives. The Scottish philosopher Thomas Carlyle once said, A man lives by believing something, not by debating and arguing about many things. I know we love to debate and argue, but don't be known for that. Don't be known for that. Be known for what you believe. Be known for your faith. If it's weak, grow your faith. One day, a three-year-old boy in Rhode Island, he, he, he goes to the, the seacoast with his dad to fly a kite. Never having seen or flown a kite, this boy had obvious doubts. And, and he was wondering, what is this thing that his dad was carrying with him? He said, I don't know about this. You know, I know planes can fly. I've seen planes in the sky. But I don't know about this, this kite. I mean, he's three years old. His father assured him that all is well. And he gave him instructions. Told him exactly what he needs to do. And as the kid unraveled the string and watched the kite go up and fly, he immediately said, I knew it would fly, Daddy. You said it would. Simple statement but profound implications. That's what you get for believing. That's what you get for believing. St. Augustine said it best. Faith is to believe what we do not see. And the reward of this faith is to see what we believe. Faith is to believe what we do not see. And the reward of that faith, the result of that faith is to see what we believe. The Colossians had such a reputation. Their faith was strong through thick and thin. They maintained their faith. Friends, in these days, as the Bible says, we need to stand firm. No matter what goes on around us, we need to stand firm. And as the Bible says, let nothing move us, that we would not waver in our faith. I pray that we'll be known for our belief in what God has said in his word and we'll actually live by it. I pray that we'll demonstrate by faith that Christ is enough. That he is the answer to all our problems. I pray that no matter what happens, we will show the world that Christ is all we need and Christ is all they need. And how do we demonstrate our faith? It's simple. By our deeds. By our actions. It's not that complicated. We demonstrate our faith by our deeds, by our works. 
In James we read, with that faith without what? Works is what? Is dead. Your works will show you what kind of faith you have. Is the gospel bearing fruit inside of you? Listen to what Paul says. Paul says, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it. Is the gospel bearing fruit? See, the gospel has always been associated with the truth. They're synonymous. It is the truth. It is the news of victory. It is the best news, the greatest news. Now, what do we do with the gospel? What do we do? Think in terms of how do we deliver it? We proclaim it. We proclaim the gospel. Good news is something that needs to be shared. Have you ever had something wonderful happen to you that you just couldn't wait to share it? When, when our son was born, Nathaniel, just four weeks ago, I couldn't wait to share that news. Why? Because it's good news. When you get that special letter from the university, you're like, yes, I got accepted. I can't wait to share this. When your team wins... You're all excited. Football's starting up in a couple of months. I am excited. When your team wins, yes. When the doctor looks at you and he smiles and he says, it's benign. You just want to explode. And he says, Lord, thank you. Good news is meant to be shared. Someone once said, the greater the news is, the louder and the longer you want to proclaim it. Well then, how tremendous is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ? How is it to you personally? Is it a good news? If you aren't proclaiming the good news, then you should examine your life in the light of this truth that you call the gospel. So Paul is thankful because he has heard of their faith in Christ, a result of the gospel bearing fruit in them. What a reputation to have. To one day leave this earth and to be known for your faith more than anything else, more than the fancy cars you drove, more than the houses you built, more than the wonderful jobs you had and the the great businesses you ran, to be known for your faith. Friends, if you are known for your faith in Christ, then you know you lived a life worthy of your calling. Friends, this is one of the reasons for Paul's thanksgiving. The church in Colossae heard the gospel, that gospel bore fruit in their life, evident by their faith, and now they're known for it. Now here's the amazing thing. Paul has never seen these people. He just got a report from Epaphras, his companion. But he's in no doubt about their spiritual position. In verse 7 it says, you learned it from Epaphras, who's the, he's the one who proclaimed it. I thank God for people who proclaimed the good news to you and did not keep it to themselves. Some of you, that's why you're here today. I thank the Lord that you were, some of you were born into godly families and you kept hearing it over and over and over again. You see, the gospel had been brought by this man who founded this church in Colossae. And he was telling Paul about the tremendous response which caused the desire in Paul to be first, to be thankful for first of their faith and then the next thing, love. The next thing they were known for is the love for God's people. Be known for your love for God's people. First, be known for your faith. Second, be known for your love. 
for God's people. In some translation, it says love for all saints. You see, their reputation included faith as well, uh, love as well. What does love got to do with it? Everything. Everything. Love is an ingredient in true and saving faith. It is the life and soul of a practical faith. Faith is made active or energetic by love. So faith cannot work unless it is associated with love. That's what the Bible teaches us. You can have the faith to move mountains, but if you do not love, it says, I am nothing. If you do not have love, you are nothing. Paul's concern in that text in Corinthians is that whatever context you find yourself in, there must be love. And there's a distinctive biblical word for love, agape, a word that is rich. It takes us beyond the superficial definition of the word love in our culture. Agape doesn't mean romantic love, doesn't mean sentimental love, doesn't mean physical love. It's a love that just gives and gives and gives. So when we talk about agape love, we're talking about the biblical love. We're talking about an act of selfless sacrifice. God so loved the world that he what? He gave the greatest gift ever. Jesus in the upper room with his disciples, the Bible says he loved them to perfection. How did he demonstrate that? Before going to the cross, he stooped down. And he washed their dirty feet. Jesus says there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. Simply stated, this is selfless sacrifice. It's not something you feel. It's something you do. I know our culture has a completely different definition of love. But friends, the biblical love is something that you do. Love is the most important attitude that can possibly exist in the life of a believer. The Colossian church modeled this so wonderfully. So Paul says, I thank God for you. I'm full of joy. I'm so proud of you. First, for your faith. Second, for your love for God's people. Be known for your love. Talk is cheap. Deeds usually aren't. That's why John says, let's not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Friends, we are responsible for one another. Do you know that? We are responsible for each other. That's why he has placed us here. Here's what it comes down to. If God has shown us love, then we need to show love. Why? We love because he first loved us. Friends, the love is the mark of genuine Christianity. Without it, I am nothing in God's eyes. Here's what you need to understand. It is quite possible for you to be something in the world, but be nothing in God's eyes. Did you get that? It's very possible for you to be something in this world, but be nothing in God's eyes. Be known for your love. God's love is not something forced. It is something that simply flows because God so overwhelms us with his love in Christ that it just flows out of us. Well, what is the demonstration of love? We have it in 1 Corinthians 13. By this, all will know that you're my disciples. By what? Your love for one another. Very simple. By this, everyone will know what? You're my disciples because of your love for one another. I pray that we would desire and have the same reputation that we'd be diligent in our love for one another, making every effort to become better acquainted and to serve one another. You see, that's why whenever there's an opportunity, we come together. Whether it be on a Sunday, Saturday, Wednesdays, whatever. We come together because of our love for one another. We enjoy each other's company and fellowship. So be known for your faith in Christ. Be known for your love. And finally, Paul says, 
I'm thankful for your faith, your love, and for the hope laid up for you in heaven. Friends, that is our calling. Be known for the hope of your calling. Paul says, the faith and love spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven. What Paul is essentially saying is that the faith the Colossians have in Christ and the love they have for God's people is because of the hope laid up for them in heaven. You see, the source of faith and love is hope. The hope that is stored up for you in heaven. Friends, hope is what keeps a person going when things seem to fall apart. And come on, let's admit it. There are things falling apart in our lives all the time. Unfortunately, just like what we have done to the word love, we have destroyed the definition and the meaning of the word hope. Because our usage of the word hope in our culture is nothing more than making a wish. Like, I hope it doesn't rain today. I hope I get to see you soon. But biblical hope is different. It is a confident assurance of the glorious future that Christ has purchased us as Christians. When the Bible uses the word hope, it is not that kind of hope. It is an assured, expectant hope. A hope that has assurance of the outcome. That is the hope of our calling. As Paul reminds us in Ephesians, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. Friends, what a worthy calling this is. What a great calling. As Paul reminds us later on, to live worthy of your calling. You see, in the Hebrew mind, there was always this connection between knowledge and, and, and conduct. From their perspective, a person did not know something unless he or she did it. Friends, if you're a believer in Christ, you have been given a calling. You have been given an important task. You have a great, great responsibility. And it's your responsibility to live worthy of your calling, the hope which awaits for you in heaven. The Bible says we look forward to that hope, with hope to that wonderful day when Christ Jesus will be revealed to us in his fullness. The picture that you see up on the screen, as you know, is the tomb of the unknown soldier at the Arlington National Cemetery, which you also see pictured there are three guards, the unflinching guards, tomb guard sentinels, all volunteers but are considered to be the best of the 3rd U.S. Infantry Regiment known as the Old Guard. Do you know that since April 6th, 1948, the old guard has stood guard? When a sentinel comes on duty, he walks exactly 21 steps across the tomb. He pauses for 20, 21 seconds, turns around, walks towards the tomb, looks at the tomb, pauses for 21 seconds, turns around takes 21 steps across the tomb, repeats it over and over and over again. When the guard is off duty, for eight hours, he prepares his uniform and his mind for duty. And every day of his duty, he gets a fresh haircut. Every day, every single day. And when he's on duty, he will not vary from his command a single step, no matter the weather, no matter the hour of the day, no matter who's watching, and no matter if no one watches at all. Let me put it this way to you. You don't walk the same way when it's your turn to guard the tomb. 
friends, neither we should we who carry the guard of Jesus Christ. It's a worthy calling. It's a worthy calling. Amen. You know, there are people who are in constant pursuit of knowledge. They just love knowledge. They want to learn everything there is to know, but their conduct speaks something else. But Paul would say there is a connection between knowledge and conduct. He would say, walking worthy doesn't mean you live a perfect life or walking perfectly. It just means that you are in step with Jesus. No matter what happens around you, no matter what happens in your life, you walk in step with Jesus. He is your number one priority in life. And you walk with him and you finish this race that he has called you to finish. The guard of the tomb of the unknown soldier. Every guard has very detailed instructions about what they are to do. Every step they take, every movement they make is based on what they've been instructed to do, what they have practiced, and what they have trained for all their lives. We as the children of God, we need to learn how to walk worthy of our calling. We need to learn how to walk worthy of our calling. And in case you're in any doubt, it is a worthy walk. Boy, it is a worthy walk. Because with it comes a sense of pride, a sense of belonging, a sense of fully knowing that my Christ is enough. He is all sufficient and he is all that I need. Therefore, I'm going to walk in truth with pride and dignity. And when that happens, we make God proud. We make God proud. The Bible says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Come on, stand with me and give God a mighty hand of praise. Thank you.